Hello, welcome to the Ghost of Harren Hall. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 234 of our chapter by chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 8 of A Feast for Crows. That's Jamie 1. <laughs> yes, it is. It is not Cersei 1. <laughs> This is this is not the only time in today the notes are going to trip us up because there's one that you wrote earlier where you put a really good typo and I was so puzzled by it. I sat looking at it for like 10 minutes like, what the heck is he talking about? <laughs> I'll reference it when we get there. All right. Well, as always, we're going to chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you. Hopefully we're going to provide you some entertainment along the way. We will summarise what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes to provide some additional information about the characters and geography of this chapter. How are you, McKelly? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Thank you for uh, for delaying a little bit to get started. We had a little bit of family drama that uh, needed to be... Mm-hmm worked out so we're all everything is uh, on the up and up now so Bro- uh, broken hearts in the ray household yes yes and you know i'm sorry requires sorry to hear. conversations and such but mm-hmm. uh, poorly timed conversations at that but you know <laughs> <laughs> well we are recording in the week of the great eclipse of yes. 2024 yes which was absolutely breathtaking i went to uh t- the city of dublin ohio which Carson chose because Carson does her homework, but it's roughly where I chose because it is just about the closest point on the totality line to where we live, which was eight hours drive still. Ah, yes. Eight hours drive for six minutes of... Not even that. We we didn't go all the way to the center of the totality line, so we only had 90 seconds, in fact. Oh, oh, wow. So, okay. So a, a few years ago, 2017, we had one much closer to us, about a two-hour drive. And a mutual friend of ours, Mark, he dro- he and his family drove down there. And Mark said it was one of the most memorable and amazing moments of his life. And now Mark did not make the drive this time, which I checked with him, uh, what was it, two days ago? Three days ago now. No, two days ago. Anyway, uh, he did not make the drive. So you made a longer drive. What's your takeaway? It's be- well... Because he was right the first time, and he was wrong this time. It's it's absolutely worth it. If you can go and see a total eclipse, it's absolutely worth it. It's a, it's an absolutely amazing experience. I don't have yeah. any photos, because I, I simply put my phone down during it. I was just like, I'm just going to bathe in this amazingness. Now, I have my 8-inch telescope, which helps. Because... So at totality, the the sun disappears and you can see the corona of the sun around it. So you've got this glow around the sort of black circle of the moon. Um, But around the edge of the the circle, you can see red dots. Through the telescope, you can see that those are solar flares coming off the sun. And they're incredible to look at. So you you use the microscope to... Microscope. Use the telescope to see the eclipse. Exactly. Wow, that is pretty neat. The whole time, or or did you... Oh, yeah, I have a solar filter, so until totality, the solar filter was on there, so we could watch the whole experience. And then, at totality, whip off the solar filter and see the... Very cool. It was really... It was truly amazing. I think I've told you before, I've probably said it on the podcast before, we went to the 2017 one as well. And I'm the astronomy buff. I... Right. Of the family. But on the drive home, which was hours and hours of gridlock traffic yeah i thought carson was going to murder me because i <laughs> exposed her to this but instead as we got home four hours later than I anticipated she said i'll go anywhere on earth to see that again wow including dublin wow. ohio a con a convert mm-hmm. you, you you created the comfort now what well, you said you didn't get a picture and i would just say if you if you're looking for a great picture Jenny posted one that she took. She was I also saw was in the it. totality. Fantastic. Yeah. Yes, it is. It was really cool. We were only about, I think, 82% yeah. here locally. And I was trying to use my to hold my glasses up to my the lens of my camera and take a picture, but I just could not get it to work out. So I have a bunch of photos of the build up and the wind down, which I'll happily post to the Discord server. Or at least one or two of them. I'll t- I'll be selective. 
taken with my cell phone through the lens of the uh, telescope. So they're pretty cool, but yeah. they aren't totality. And I mean, 82% sounds good, but really when you're talking about eclipses, the difference between 99 and 100 is pretty big. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, here, it got a little dusky. Yeah, it would. For, for about, yeah. about 20 and minutes. And did you go out and see the hour? light through the trees? Yes. Yes, that's yes. a pretty thing to do, yeah. Yeah, it, it was neat, but it was a little, you know, it was nothing, nothing compared to what you all saw, well, I'm sure. Well, I mean, for 95% of the time I was looking at the solar eclipse, it was very similar to what you saw. It was just that little middle bit True. was super special yes. where I was. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and again, Dublin, Ohio, which is basically practically a suburb of Columbus, Ohio. I, uh-huh. I'd never heard of this place. I had no... It was really? absolutely beautiful. Have, have you heard of Dublin, Ohio? Well, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, so you know I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with okay. Ohio cities. You, you, you think these two things are connected? Good, I understand that. So they're, they're neighboring got, states. It has a river running through it, which is absolute for me as an English person. It's a vast river. It's and it's called the what's the river that runs through Dublin, Ohio? The Ohio River? No, although I did cross uh-huh. the Ohio River, and that really is an enormous river. That is huge. And not only is it huge, but it's huge a bazillion miles from the ocean. Do you know where the Ohio River is formed? I do not know where the Ohio River is formed. The Ohio River is formed at the confluence of the Allegheny River oh, is it in and the Monongahela Pittsburgh? River, oh. right there in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And it runs My to the ocean, hometown. right? It does run to the ocean. The Ohio, I think it runs to the Mississippi. In the oh, okay. It's still, still, okay, probably a long way from the Mississippi still, where I was. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I'm not sure where it joins. My, my geography is not uh, that The thing is, date. I'm from a little <laughs> island. The rivers have no opportunity to get that big. Oh, yeah, right. Sure. The longest river in England is like 100 miles. So huh, at yeah. the, when they hit the ocean, they're like, you know, you can jump across them. Little tributaries. Exactly. This thing, the Ohio River is like, it took appreciable length of time to drive over the bridge. <laughs> Do you know, um, I I lived in Pittsburgh until I was uh, into my mid-20s. And I learned two weeks ago a fact about the Ohio River that I had never known despite growing up in the city. Do tell. The, the river should be named the Allegheny River. Okay. Because... By traditional standard naming conventions of rivers, at at least in the United States, I don't know about the rest of the world, but uh, I was just getting this information from a guy who was spewing facts. (laughs) When two rivers meet at a confluence, the larger river usually gives the name name. continues on. Uh, Yes. So the Allegheny, who's bigger than the Monongahela, should... Continue I, I, the name. I, I will say, I don't think I know of another example where two rivers con- converge to form a right. differently named third river. Again, I'm from England. They're all singletons <laughs> and they're all 50 miles long. <laughs> they're creeks. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but yeah, so, but, but Dublin has a, it has a suspension bridge over the, the, the river in Dublin is called the, uh, the Scioto, spelled oh, okay. S-C-I-O-T-O. It itself is bigger than any river in England. Has a so it has this suspension bridge, which is a footbridge, and linking the historic part to the new part. The new part has restaurants. It had a free video game arcade. You could just play video oh. games for free. Cool. I, I knocked the rust off my Pac-Man skills while I was there. Ah, uh, yeah, I bet you did. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. And uh, several uh, local breweries which had good beer, and I was like, I fell in love with the place. I talked to some locals and I said, I said, this is a great town. I said, honestly, when I came to Ohio, I thought it was going to be empty because of so many Ohio people live in North Carolina. I didn't <laughs> think there was going to be anyone left. <laughs> but I said, your town is charming. And they said, yes, but you came in April. She, they said, uh, yeah. the previous six months are why you moved to North Carolina. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Ethan could tell you about that firsthand. Mm-hmm. Well, this has been a lovely... Uh, travel uh chamber of commerce video for our podcast for dublin ohio I, I, honestly i was I, I was charmed by the place and i had zero expected because i'd done zero homework right i just expected boarded up town nobody there 
Uh-huh. <laughs> it's a, see us in North Carolina. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it had it had waterfalls in the town. You could walk to a waterfall. A series of waterfalls. Sounds, sounds like an incredibly charming locale. It truly was. And get this, actually, this is the most amazing part of all. We popped into the library. The library was very charming. A, a new building, a very interesting architecture, a worthy addition to the town. We went in and had a look around. First thing we saw was a book written by a person who I used to babysit. Are you kidding? I am not kidding. There's a kid who wow. who grew up here, but their parents were Scottish and they've moved back to Scotland now. And they've grown up, apparently, enough to the point where they <laughs> yes. can write novels. And the novel <laughs> was on a display section of, like, librarian-recommended books in Dublin, Ohio. I was like, what? Very cool. So, yeah. yeah. How about that? Well, that's yeah, that's yeah. something. I don't um, know what the, that is, but it's the, something. The book, the 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 uh, writer is I, it's her initials. It's C. E. McGill, and the book I think is called Our Hideous Progeny. That's the book. So there you go. Oh, I haven't read it. All right. but recommendation. I have held it, mouth agog in Dublin, Ohio library. But <laughs> I'm just impressed that you went to a library. The cost needed the bathroom. Oh, <laughs> I just here thought you were a bibliophile. You went in to <laughs> peruse the local library. Plus the library part, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's get down to business. How did we leave Jamie Lannister? So last we saw of Jamie, he was handing the family legacy Oathkeeper over to Brienne of Tarth in order to salve his, his oh-so-precious conscience. Since then... <laughs> He helped his little brother to escape the Black Cells, but he hadn't banked on Tyrion actually murdering their father, Tywin. When Tywin's body was discovered, Jaime led the hunt to find Tyrion and Varys, since Jaime coerced the Spymaster to help get Tyrion free. Last chapter, we saw him standing shiver over his father's body in the Sept of Baelor. McKelly, why don't we give the summary of this one? All right. Well, Jaime stands watch over his father's corpse. Every muscle aches, only his missing hand still has any feeling. Balon Swan and Loras Tyrell try to relieve him, but he is determined to see out a full week. They leave him to his self-recrimination. He tries to blame Varys, who was only supposed to get Tyrion to a ship. Varys is as much to blame as Jaime or Tyrion. He recalls forcing Varys to help, who was curious as to why Jaime wanted to free Tyrion. Does Jaime believe his innocence? Jamie says it doesn't matter. A Lannister always pays his debts. Jamie's last memory of Tyrion is his vicious statement about Cersei's infidelities and Tyrion's admission to killing Joffrey. But he hadn't added, and I'm off to kill Dad. Jamie would have <laughs> stopped him at that. Varys is now missing. Jamie imagines the two of them on a ship to Essos, toasting their success. Or Varys is murdered and left in the tunnels. Jamie had organised a thorough search of the dungeons, but they're far more extensive than he'd ever imagined. At a junction, they did find a mosaic of a three-headed dragon. There, Jamie heard Rhaegar's voice calling him Kingslayer. He recalled their farewell. Jamie had begged leave to join Rhaegar at the Trident, but Rhaegar knew that Ares wanted Jamie as hostage against Tywin's perfidy. Jamie protested, and Sir John Derry dressed him down, but Rhaegar was more conciliatory. After the battle, he'll call a council and make some changes. Changes did come, but not by Rhaegar, who died in the ensuing battle. Thousands had filed past Tywin's body, most not unhappy. King's Landing remembered the sacking, but Pycelle was genuinely distraught. Jamie had interrogated the under-jailer, Renifer Longwaters, about the missing jailer, Rugen. He'd had his position since Ares' day, was rarely there except when needed, which as chief of the Black Cells was rarely. Tyrion, Pycelle, Ned Stark and a trio that were sent to the Wall were the only recent occupants of the Black Cells. Jamie wants to question the two turnkeys that worked the Black Cells, but they've been killed by the Kettleblacks. Jamie is mad at Cersei and with some amount of gall accuses the Kettleblacks as having been too keen to kill the turnkeys as if they had something to hide. He banishes them from his sight. The Mummer's farce continued when the gold cloaks were sent to search the brothels for Tyrion. Jamie's thoughts turn to Brienne. He says a prayer to the father, but the god or the corpse? Doesn't matter. Neither listen. 
At midnight, the Septons enter for their devotions. Their chants lull Jamie. He recalls his vigil before being knighted by Sir Arthur Dane. A woman enters the Sept. The Septons have now left. Jamie's so tired he'd missed that. It turns out to be Cersei in full flirtation mode. She tells him that Kevin has refused and knows about their liaisons. The High Septon too. She pleads with him to be Hand of the King. But he's firm. He was made for battle, not council chambers. She flies into a rage. A fool to come. A fool to ever love him. Then storms out. At dawn, the devotions are punctuated by gagging. The smell is getting intolerable. The Tyrells arrive... Marjorie places a large bouquet of roses at Tywin's feet, but wisely keeps one for her own nose. Jamie admires her smarts. Tommen could do worse. Cersei arrives and forces Tommen to pray. With a sob and a wrench, the little king makes a run for it. Jamie follows. Tommen wasn't scared, just appalled by the stench. Jamie tells him that a man can endure anything by just going away inside. Cersei arrives with a more heavy handed approach to parenting. But Jamie intervenes. Their spiteful comments are ended by the arrival of Mace Tyrell. Jamie invites the Lord of Highgarden to sup with Cersei that evening. She manages to bite her tongue until Tyrell leaves, but insists that she won't make him the hand. Then send him to besiege Storm's End. But he won't leave King's Landing until Marjorie marries Tommen. Then wed them. Who cares? He's too young to consummate it, and if things change by then, they can get it annulled. Cersei is impressed. Jamie almost sounds like their father. We'll be right back. Hello, friends. Are you ready to make some unforgettable memories? Well, if so, consider the Marriott Bonvoy program. Discover the perfect destination for your summer getaway and unlock exclusive deals on luxurious accommodations. With our affiliate partnership, you'll enjoy unbeatable savings and a seamless booking experience. Don't let summer slip away. Visit Marriott Bonvoy today and make this vacation season one for the books. Use our Ghosts of Heron Hall affiliate page to check it all out and buy Bonvoy points or give some as a gift. The link to our page is in the show notes. She seems to, she gives him a lingering look, it says, the description says. Mm-hmm. So she seems to um, almost be aroused by that concept yeah is... stop oh <laughs> this is already icky enough without you making it worse <laughs> yeah. but i have to say the the, sh- the standing over your father's corpse for seven days and seven nights without a break is i mean first of all it's not humanly possible and second of all uh, to volunteer yeah. to do it and to refuse any offer of any help smacks of something more than just grief honestly like right. guilt Yes, and we, you know, we're in his head, so we know he is feeling immense guilt right. for yeah. his role in Tywin's death, which was inadvertent. You know, it was. He didn't mean yeah. it, but you know, despite this guilt, he avoids confronting it directly when he he's speaking from time to time to his father's corpse, and he when he was thinking about Varys and Varys's role in the whole thing, he he says to Tywin's corpse. The bl- this your blood or something like that. Your blood is on Varys's hands as much as in what he wants to say is mine, but he can't get the word out. So instead, he says Tyrion's, mm-hmm. and it, it's almost like he still can't can't say something to his father that he wants to say, even yeah. though his father is dead. I, I do think so. that psychologically, it's not good for Jamie to do this. I mean, like. He has Great. suffered a series of losses, if you think about it. I mean, he uh, he lost his father, he lost a son recently, he lost a hand. There are things that you can do to handle grief. I mean, like, throwing yourself into work to handle grief is not totally a bad idea, necessarily. But if your work is right. just to stand there over the body, brooding for seven days and yeah. seven nights, I don't think many psychologists would recommend it. Agreed. If we had Dr. Honda on again, I'd love to get Dr. <laughs> Honda's opinion about... Uh, all so much about yeah. uh, Jamie and Cersei here, but uh, yeah, you know, the th- you know the thing is, is later in the chapter he thinks that he feels no real grief for the loss. There's no tears. He wonders where his tears are. I think it's more of guilt than grief. Yeah, really. I, yeah, I think so. Although 
I mean, I think that bit you're referring to, it's it that that is more a sort of like a not necessarily Jamie throwing shade at Tywin, but George Martin throwing shade at Tywin. That Jamie's saying, I can't emote my grief towards you because you yourself taught me not to. Yes. And so that I, I I'm the man I am because of you, and so you don't get tears. It's your own fault. Right. Yes, that good distinction you make there. Um, I also, on the subject of distinctions, I like the slight distinction that we get between Bale and Swan and Loras Tyrell. We skipped over this a little bit in the summary, but Swan and uh, Tyrell try to convince Jamie to stand down and let them take over. Um, right. Jamie says, no, it's my job. Go away. Bale and Swan goes away and drags Loras Tyrell uh, with him. Loras Tyrell wants to keep fighting the fight and wants to convince Jamie right. to be, But Bale and Swan... And they're not very different in age, particularly, I think. Balan Swan's quite young as well. He's young. I, he's not as young as Loras, oh, yeah. but he is a young man. But they're well, both yeah. new to the Kingsguard. Yes. They they were they were both appointed before while Jamie was gone. Right. Uh, Balan Swan just, you know, he just I think Loras still thinks with his sword, if you see what I mean. Yeah. He just keeps trying he always he seems to want to fight the good fight. And not pick his battles. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, this is not the battle to pick. This is a man grieving for his father. Yeah. If he wants to continue to to stay and, uh, you know, stand vigil over him, let the man do what he needs to do. One one piece of information we gained from this chapter was that Jamie, it, we've been told this several times, but I never quite believed it. Jamie really did coerce Varys into helping him. I just, I just he thought <laughs> that Varys was standing next to Jamie, going, "You know, we could get him out if you want. <laughs> I've got the key. We could get him out." But really, Varys was not. Varys was forced into this without any, the, the, yes. no question about it. Yes, we we certainly see what Varys meant by. Your brother can be quite persuasive, right. which is what he told Tyrion in the in the dungeons. And uh, yeah, he he basically Jamie basically ambushed Varys in his chamber, knocked him down from behind, put a knife to his throat, and said, "You're gonna free Tyrion." And I thought, that's a, oh, it might be a little bit odd to go straight to that rather than wait for. Varys and say, hey, you're going to free Tyrion. Maybe he would have done it without all of the other, just the threat of the other things. <laughs> I think the strangest thing about that is that he's in Varys' chambers, and when Varys comes in, he says something along the lines of fancy meeting you here. Well, it's my chambers, of course I'm here. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I would have th- the reason I always was always sceptical that he was genuinely coerced was because you wouldn't need to coerce Varys for this. If you asked right. Varys nicely, hey, do you want to help free Tyrion? He'd be like, sure. Yeah, at least he would, at the very least, do it under the threat of the things <laughs> right. that Jamie did. I don't think that there's, that Varys will say, you're not going to do that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> oh, I will watch. <laughs> now, Jamie says that he, Varys gets interested in what Jamie's saying because Jamie. He says, well, why do you want to let Tyrion go? Do you not believe in his guilt anymore? Do you think he's innocent? And Jamie says that that doesn't matter. I pay, Lannisters always pay their debts. Now, I think you and I know what Jamie means by that. This is all to do with right. Tysha. Yes. Does Varys know the Tysha story? We don't know if he knows the Tysha yeah, story. I, I, don't, I couldn't think of any time when Varys would have heard that. And Varys, Varys listens carefully to things people say, and I wonder if he's like, what did Jamie mean by that? Right. And Varys yeah, being the kind of person be. he is, I wonder if that will set him off down pathways looking for that information. Like, yeah. for, for instance, we don't know where Tyrion and Varys are now, but if they're together, I wonder if Varys is saying to Tyrion, what did your brother mean when he said... <laughs> so he said to me... <laughs> exactly. Pay his debt... What and Tyrion was so angry when he last left Jamie. He might just tell him, you know what he did to me. Well, that's true. That's very true. But we also learned that Jamie truly doesn't know where Varys went. So far, we've we've only had Cersei's perspective in this book, 
So we were unsure whether Jamie actually knew where Varys was. I, I suspected uh, but... he didn't know because it very much felt like this plan got out of Jamie's control quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did. The whole Tywin being dead thing and all. <laughs> yes, yes. So ja- Jamie thinks to himself that he would have stopped Tyrion if he'd known that he was going to kill his father. Then he would be a kinslayer. But I, I-, I would question that. You don't actually, you wouldn't need to kill Tyrion to prevent him killing Tywin. You could have just right. marched him to the ship and put it on, put him on it. Yeah, it, what I found noteworthy about that conversation is that Jamie would have, based on his phrasing, then I would be a kinslayer instead of him. Sounds to me like he's thinking he would kill Tyrion if, uh, if it yes. came to that. I see what so, you mean. What he means is he would kill Tyrion to protect his father. He's not saying he would necessarily yes. have had to do that, but he's willing to do it. Yeah, interesting. And, and so Jamie would have chosen Tywin despite the cruelty and monstrous nature, nature over Tyrion in that situation is what it felt like to me. Yeah. And that's, that's, I mean, it's hard not to be Team Tyrion a little bit, but that's disappointing, you know? Because yeah. Tywin's a genuine monster. I mean, right. think about the fact you're unable to cry over his body here, Jamie. Whereas Tyrion is a brother who loves you very dearly and wants the best for you. Yeah, now he was... There's two he's here. Jamie was just recently told by Tyrion... That Tyrion killed Joffrey, who Tyrion knows is Jaime's son. So maybe he's feeling less guilty and sorry for Tyrion. I, I still feel that given the weight of evidence to suggest that it wasn't Joff- that it wasn't Tyrion that killed Joffrey, a angry confession to the crime would not convince me of his guilt. I agreed. And I think in this line here about then... Jamie would be the kinslayer. I think you could, if you dug deep enough, you could you could find a little nugget of that because he uh-huh. says, then I'd be the kinslayer, not him. But Tyrion just told him that he killed Joffrey, which would make him a, a kinslayer and a kingslayer. But uh, so the fact that he says, I would be the kinslayer, not him, possibly means that he doesn't fully believe that Tyrion did it. Agreed. Agreed. Good point. So, <laughs> so Simon's looking right now at a note that says Simon was right about Tyrion's message, <laughs> and he has no idea what it's about. You got that, that was right. intentional, <laughs> but but let's dwell anyway. I was right. <laughs> it's something you you just never get tired of hearing, right? <laughs> what I'm referring to is that last chapter, right? Yes, so she was last, last chapter. Yeah, I think it was last chapter. We were, you had mentioned, we were talking about Tyrion's assertion to Jaime that Cersei had had sex with uh, Lancel and Osmond Kettleblack and and Um, Moonboy. And you had said, I think the addition of Moonboy damages the legitimacy of the accusation. Yes, I did say that. And I think that does seem to be kind of what's going on in Jamie's head. He thinks about this a lot throughout the chapter. Right. Just randomly, his mind will go to that phrase. And I think the the addition of Moon Boy puts just enough spiteful hyperbole right. in it to discredit, if you're not wanting to believe it. If you're looking for reasons to discount what he's saying, then that addition of Moon Boy, be like, no, he was just lashing out. He, I, interesting. So. It's because we were talking last time about Cersei's uh, ability to ignore evidence that didn't conform to her worldview. Right. And yeah, I remember. That's, Jamie's kind of doing the same thing here. He's like, yes. well, she definitely isn't sleeping with Moon Boy, so right. she's not so sleeping with the, anyone. Throw the whole thing out. The day I catch her in bed with Moon Boy, then I'll know. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> then I'll believe him. And at... The service at the end of the chapter, uh, Cersei is being Cersei and Tommen are being escorted down the aisle to Tywin's body by Osmond Kettleblack, and while he's while they're you know oh he pictures him naked down, right he he pictures them naked together and yeah. it's really bothering him. 
So uh, it's it's certainly whether he fully believes it or not, it's taking hold in yeah. his mind. Like like Tyrion in Cersei's mind is living rent free. <laughs> yes. Now this line of uh, Tyrion's is living rent free in Jamie's head as well. <laughs> Lancel, Osmond, Kettle Black, and Moonboy <laughs> all lounging around naked in his. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's tough. That's a tough way to go. I will say, I'm quite surprised that no Lord Commander of the King's Guard has ever thought to truly explore and map Magos' tunnels. It's yeah, a serious breach of bodyguard duty to not know about these things. Right. I hadn't thought about it until I saw it in the notes. And yes, you, that's... That is... You know, especially considering that they... the At least the third level and below seems to be mostly empty. You could have torches down there and strings running, you know, yeah. every which way, like ropes running everywhere to, to map out where things are. And, Tywin, yeah, nothing. Tywin cannot be the first ruler to have been murdered because of these tunnels. It must yeah, have happened yeah. in the past. Magor the Misunderstood was found dead on the Iron Throne. Ah, somebody, somebody mm. used the tunnels against him. Possibly. Or it was the throne itself. Um, so the interaction between, we get this in flashback, but between Rhaegar and Jaime is quite interesting. It's It sort of parallels the Jaime Loras Tyrell interaction. Um, that, yeah, yeah. That Rhaegar, uh, Jaime comes across as slightly in awe of, of Rhaegar. And Rhaegar comes across as quite considerate and thoughtful to the younger man, as if he's like, you know, he sees promise in him and wants the best for him. Yeah, we, we don't know Rhaegar very well, so it's tough to know if he was that way with everybody. Just, you know, kind. I mean, according to Robert Baratheon, he kidnapped and raped Lyanna Stark, but... Yeah, you know, I would say that's one extreme of what we've heard of Rhaegar. Right. A lot of other so, people say nice things about him. Yeah, uh, Barriss and Selmy. Barriss and Selmy is the one I was Rhaegar's most thinking of. little yes, sister, indeed. but mm -hmm. yeah... It was very clear that Jamie really wanted to fight by Rhaegar's side. Now, it's unclear if that was to protect Rhaegar because of how much esteem he held him in, or because he was young and hungry and wanted to prove himself to fight. in battle. Yeah. Now, on the other end, Rhaegar does put his hand on Jamie and explain that changes are coming, and it very much felt like a, a big brother, little brother type, everything's going to be okay when I get back. So there definitely felt like there was a level of care between the two. There's a whole and... interesting fan fiction for Rhaegar coming back from that battle. Rhaegar defeating Robert. And so... Oh, you're saying there there's an opportunity. An for opportunity that. for, yes. I, I, I yes. mean, just the thought process of it. You know, would, would Rhaegar have done something to unseat his lunatic father and actually become the greatest king in the Seven Kingdoms history? Yes. That would be pretty good. Um, it actually might be terribly dull. <laughs> Maybe. But I'm sure we could trump up some uh, <laughs> some drama. In yeah. Pro yes, probably. Yeah. So the, the changes that Rhaegar mentions are coming, he never does get to see through because he's died. Now, we did discuss in Ned 10 about s some things involving the uh, the changes that he had meant to do earlier in you know, is going to do after this battle. But I went back and looked at what we talked about. And they were surprisingly spoilery. So <laughs> I'm going to leave them out and hope that people forgot that we brought them up. <laughs> I was like, did we really say these things? But that was back in Game of Thrones. We were still learning our way. So. <laughs> but Jamie it was left behind from the battle because he was being used as a shield by King Ares against Tywin. Yeah. And Rhaegar tells Jamie the reason for this is because Ares fears Tywin more than he fears Robert. Yep. And at that point, the Lannisters were not in open rebellion against the crown, against the Targaryen. So the silence from uh, Casterly Rock was more unsettling than the known rebel forces that were that they were fighting. So I, I thought that was I thought that was a noteworthy distinction there. Well, in some ways it it maps to what we already know, of course, because Robert's rebellion 
was it was everything was on a knife edge at this point and Tywin's decision of which side to come in on was going to be extremely significant to the outcome of the war and yes, therefore was, right. in many respects he was the kingmaker here between Robert and now as it turned out Robert didn't really need him Tywin didn't join in until the decision was already made but had Tywin jumped in one direction or the other, that side would have prevailed, almost certainly. Right. So I, yeah, I, I think point. we kind of knew all that, that, that Ares yeah. was was afraid of Tywin's defection yeah. to Robert. When you explain it that way, that does make some sense. Yeah, I can see that now. But he does, uh, Jamie does find it amusing that Ares thought no harm would come to him if Jamie was near. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's a little bit yeah. ironic, <laughs> sadly ironic. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, for as paranoid as Ares was, he was surprisingly trusting in Jamie and his Kingsguard. I I was thinking about it with the level of paranoia that Ares was was feeling at, at this point. I would not have been surprised if he put Jamie in a position where if Tywin crossed him, Jamie would pay the price. Like dangle Jamie at the top of the top of a wall or something you know outside the above a gate and say but, but you I come think, in here i'm dropping him i think implicitly that's what he was doing by keeping him there but of course him being the only king's guard did sort of like shift things because i think he was the only king's guard in king's landing right uh yeah they were all pretty well spread out right there were several with liana and several with rhaegar so right yeah. so it meant that it meant that Tywin, sorry, Ares is keeping him there was both the threat to Tywin. I've got your son, I could do anything. But you're absolutely right. Ares should have thought, but hang on a second, he's bigger than me. <laughs> <laughs> but Ares wasn't thinking too straight at the time. Because if you think about what Ares did then, he, he must have realized, that, you know, it's it's like the question that Varys posed about, you know, who's who's got the strength? Where, where does power right. lie? Right. Power lay with Ares, except he'd brought into his, to his bosom, an armed, dangerous man, who he then told to bring him his father's head, you know? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Right. You'd have to be yeah, crazy. That is... But that's what Ares was. <laughs> <laughs> right. And Rhaegar calls Robert, cousin Robert. And just a quick reminder, Robert's grandmother was Rael Targaryen, Targaryen yeah. the daughter of Aegon V, who was aunt to King Ares, Ares II. So that's why he calls him cousin. But you know, uh, but you know, Jamie notices that a lot of sad faces and uh, come and go, thousands of them, and he thinks most of them look really sad but probably aren't all that sad because Tywin really wasn't all that well liked he was respected but not all that well liked except for one except well aside from Kevin Kevin looked pretty upset from yeah. what we've seen from the Cersei chapters but uh, aside from his brother Kevin poor Grand Maester Pycelle seemed to be genuine genuinely broken up about the death of Tywin he refers to him as the greatest man I've ever known, which yeah. is quite a, yeah. quite a statement. And he served six kings. Right. Yeah, Mr. Pycelle, not Tywin. Yes, 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 yes. So. I understood who you meant, yes. Yeah, I, I think I think Pycelle genuinely respected Tywin, but also he's very worried about how he's seen by the Lannister children. Because oh, yeah. we know what Tyrion thought of him. Right. Uh, we know what Cersei thinks of him. Jamie doesn't he... seem to be too bothered one way or the other. J Jamie really does sort of like keep that kind of thing at arm's length. I mean, Cersei embodies all the sort of politicking and sort of like moving the pieces around the board, and Jamie just doesn't care about it. But right, they're they're the power that Tywin once was, and they do not have the same respect for Pycelle. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by Audible. To get a free audiobook, or two if you're an Amazon Prime member, go to our exclusive URL, audibletrial.com slash ghostsherrenhall. You can find the link in our show notes. That is true. Yeah, Jamie thinks after he talks with Pycelle 
that one's dying as well. Cersei might have been right thinking that he was useless. Yeah. So, yeah, that could be also why he's distraught. Yeah. Now, the six kings that he served were Aegon V, Egg, Jaehaerys II, Aerys II, King Robert, Joffrey, and Tommen. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, Aegon V was thought of as, as a pretty good king, compassionate, loved by the small folk, but, but then it really tails off at the... Uh... Yeah, God. <laughs> I mean... I'd like to think I'm better than most of them. The last <laughs> <Stop>. four. <laughs> I mean, Tommen, who knows? He could be great, but he's a kid, you know? Right. So being the greatest man he's ever known, greater than any uh, any of the six kings, you, you got to uh, yeah. color that a, a little bit, I guess. Mm-hmm. So, he, it, you know, one thing is for sure is that Tywin was cold, calculating, and as we mentioned, respected, not so much love. So... Clearly, these are things that Grand Maester Pycelle finds uh, to be a you to be good in a uh, an effective ruler, an emotionless, no nonsense kind of ruler. Yeah. So, and now he did have a long history of supporting Tywin in yes. the Lannister interest. Back in Tyrion Six of a Clash of Kings, when Tyrion had Grand Maester Pycelle thrown in the dungeon. He told Tyrion that he's the one that convinced Ares to open the gates for Tywin so that the sack of King's Landing happened, hoping that Tywin would take the Iron Throne and become the king that he felt Tywin was, uh, you know, go, would, would excel at. And he also let John Aaron die because he knew John Aaron knew about Jamie and Cersei's incest. And he thought that Cersei wanted John Aaron dead to prevent them from to prevent him from acting on that knowledge so he's done a lot of, he's very much always been in the lannister camp oh yeah everything i said about pycel was predicated on that that he is that he's lannister through and through now and so he needs the Lannister because he is a complete lannister loyalist he needs lannister support and he's worried yes. he's lost it in now that tywin's gone Yes. I, 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 I whenever we think about Pycelle, I always think there's self interest is the biggest single motivator for that man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can see that perspective. We do get a little bit more info, info on Rugen. Rugen is the jailer who never came to work and uh, has gone missing and was found since, since to. Since Tyrion have, went missing. Yes. <laughs> was found to have a. Uh, coin that could only have come from the reach in his chambers um right the crown pays for 20 turnkeys but there's never been more than 12 and they pays for six under jailers but there are only three what do we make of this um we speculate that rugen might be varis that just that his pattern of behavior is that of varis in that he comes and goes and he's only there when needed he can't be a jailer he's busy being varis the rest of the time you know yeah, and there's a few specific instances, like when uh, Longwaters, Renner for Longwaters, mentions that Rugen was in charge of the Black Cells and that uh, Ned Stark, Grand Maester Pycelle, and Tyrion were the the most three recent in the Black Cells. We know that when Varys came to visit Ned, he came in a guard costume. Ah. Now, he could have been coming as a turnkey, yeah. you know, a, a fill-in turnkey. But, and obviously when he met Tyrion at the end of Storm of Swords in the dungeon, when he was, Tyrion was freed, he was also wearing a guard, yeah, a guard outfit. So, you know. But, but is there something to this understaffing? Is, is Varys skimming Uh, off the top? It seems, well, it seems a very mundane thing for Varys to be doing. I think that, yes. So what we're talking about is there's a discrepancy between the funding for the, uh, jail system and the actual staffing right. of the jail system and it certainly feels like some possible embezzlement going on here and yeah. i we have talked in the past about how Littlefinger might be uh might be embezzling or skimming and a lot of these reports go to the uh, master of coin and i wonder if he is the one who is do- saying yeah we, we you know when he sends his gives his reports Yes, we're paying for 20, uh, 20, what is it, 20 turnkeys and six under jailers. But really, they're only paying for less than 
half of that. Oh, you think it's Peter Baelish that's skimming off yes, the top? Yes, oh. he's skimming off, and that's because he's he's and he has acquired a considerable amount of wealth. We've discussed this uh, before, but his his keep. We've seen. We've been to his keep. Uh, on the fingers it, it, he's not a, <laughs> it, it wasn't legacy wealth he was bringing no and his role i'm sure you know i'm sure he can he has some investments going but uh he's hmm. got a lot he seems to have a lot of money so i wondered if this might be an example of where he could be skimming or embezzling yeah and and then continuing the the thought process if rugen is varis we do now have an intersection point between jack and hagar and varis Yes, Which we do. Could be significant because if Rugen, as head of the Black Cells, was involved in, and indeed, I think uh, Renifer Longwater says that he didn't agree with the idea of get, setting the three prisoners to the wall. He thought that was a bad idea. Um, right. Ned Stark's idea, though, so. Right, yes. But Rugen Varys may have intercepted with Jack and Hagar, and Jack and Hagar is up to something, perhaps. From... Uh huh. I'm with so you. I'm with you. I have no yes. idea why this would happen, but the two of them have met. I think we can safely yeah. say. Right. And the black cells, as Renifer Longwaters tells us, are so rarely used. So it makes you wonder what did these three do to yeah. end up in there? And as we've discussed in the past, how did Jack and Hagar, if we believe that he could be a, a faceless man, how did he end up in the black cells? Could that have been intentional? Possibly. Here's some. Here's a scenario for you. What if Illyrio Mopatis had hired the, a faceless man to do something here in Westeros, and Varys kept him in the black cells as the start of whatever goal that they ultimately mm, had? Very interesting. We do know that it's it's heavily suspected, and the ghost of High Heart's dream suggests that a faceless man killed Balon Greyjoy. And we know that a man whose description very much matches the new description of Jack and Hagar got the key that opens every door in the Citadel yeah. in the prologue of this book. So maybe they're using him to destabilize the realm as Varys and Illyrio had planned. Yeah, and and as Rugen, Varys could control who gets brought to the Black Cells. And once they're in the Black Cells... Only he can talk to them, you know, sort of thing. So right. there's, yeah, interesting. Uh, one thing I noticed throughout this chapter is that at various points, Jamie's having a little bit of trouble remembering what he ought to know and not know about the whole Tyrion Tywin thing. And I worry that he's going to get himself into trouble, particularly being as tired as he is, that he might say something out of turn. Oh, yes, good point. He, he wants to, at one point, he, he wants to interview the turnkeys and then he's mad about them getting murdered that's got to be good news for him. The less evidence that can be gathered, the better, because he is involved. Yes, yes, yeah. Maybe he just feels bad that they got murdered for nothing. Maybe that's all. I it think is. there's some of that. He yeah. thinks to himself, "I told Varys no one is to get hurt right. in this. I guess I should have told that to my brother and sister." Yeah. So there might be some <laughs> of that. Overall, I think he's doing a, a decent job of executing an investigation into the murder and escape that. He had a very big hand in, you know, he's he's doing all the things like sending the gold cloaks to search the brothels and interviewing the under jailer here and but, standing but, uh, vigil over the body. Yeah. Also, um, investigating the tunnels is a good idea because because he must. It, it's a legitimate thought that once you've murdered Tywin, you might come down and murder Varys as well. To yeah. find Varys's body down there is definitely a possibility. Right. Yeah, so I feel like he's got his tracks fairly well covered. I think at this point, his the the biggest issue is guilt. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got one that I'll bring up in pedantry. Just it's not okay. it's not serious, but it's just enough to make me go: Is this guy in the right mind? Is he going to keep his? <laughs> are those loose lips going to sink this ship? All right. I look forward to it. So, speaking of the turnkeys that that were killed. Cersei, when Jamie approaches the Kettle Blacks about you know them, he seems very shocked when he learns from Renifer Longwaters that these turnkeys were killed. And then he he confronts the Kettle Blacks and he takes in the scene, 
about their death, about about you know the scene of the turnkey's death, and they say, "Hey, Cersei said she wanted them to sleep forever, so we were just doing what Cersei said." And and that's when he he comes up with that story. Hey, you did that a little too quickly. I might wonder whether you were involved in this somehow. Well. We were there when Cersei said this. It was in Cersei 1 in Tywin's chamber. And you know who else was there when this conversation happened? Was Jamie. So <laughs> so he was in the chamber during the conversation, but now he seems entirely shocked by this fact. So mm-hmm. clearly he wasn't paying attention when Cersei said this. So uh by the way, I don't have anything to say in pedantry now. Oh, okay. <laughs> that is basically it. That's basically what I was going to say. Yeah, that's. Oh, is that? Yeah, I mean that he. That's pedantry, right? I mean he 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 knew they were going to do this, and to be surprised and maddened when they did it just seems okay. I ruined your pedant. We we could take all this and play, play it in pedantry. It's fine. It, 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 everything you said rings true for me. And on the subject of but Cersei, she's still obsessed with who Tyrion has told and what they know. So last chapter, she kept returning to the High Septon as Tyrion's man and wondering what he knew. We hear this again via Jamie, and now she's adding Kevin to the mix as well. She's telling Jamie that Kevin knows as well. Tyrion's told everyone, you know. And yeah, she really wants to keep this under wraps. Jamie, of course, has taken the other tack of let's get married. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing Kevin very possibly uh, was just observant and present yeah. and noticed there's something fishy going on here. Yeah. The, the, the way to get these two idiots to crack is to say, hey, are you two sleeping together? What? What? <laughs> <laughs> they would give themselves up in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, on the cool. subject of these two as lovers, they never seem to be on the same wavelength. Each of them seems oh, to know. wait for the <laughs> worst possible moment to make advances to the other one. They like to, to make advances over dead bodies. And dead bodies members. are a big factor, yeah. 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 Yes. yeah. yeah. As if it's not icky well, enough. We see Cersei here exploiting what she knows Jamie wants. She says to him, We will please be my Tommen's hand of the king. We will rule as king and queen. And we know that's exactly what Jamie said to her over Joffrey's body as, you know, we'll be king and queen or we'll go back to Casterly Rock. Who cares about the Iron Throne? Uh, you know, and it's just it's her trying to manipulate and giving and withholding love. You know, she says, you said you'd love me and it's not loving to make me beg. And then, uh, you know. I need my other half with me, in me. And, and and then when he rejects her, she snatches that love away. And oh, I was yeah. a fool to ever have loved you. And, yeah. you know, it's it's very clear what she's up to here. Yeah. I, I will say that eventually she's going to stop asking him because he's nothing if not consistent about his <laughs> desire to stay as Lord Commander of the Kingsguard and to not be the Hand of the King. He could not be more emphatic. No, he really couldn't. He really hasn't minced words here yeah. <laughs> about this. So you you notice that when uh, Jamie gives Tommen the advice to go away inside, and I'm doing air quotes for the listeners, um, that uh, poor little Tommen started to say that, oh, I already know that trick because I used to do it when Joffy... And then he doesn't finish the sentence. And I just hope that all he was going to say at the end of that sentence was brutally tortured me physically and psychologically because. Yeah, there are worse things. I mean, that's what you'd expect from Tom and uh, from Joffrey, just that. But it did feel like he might say something even worse. But God help us. Yeah, being Joffrey's younger brother, uh, the surely the torment that he had to endure. Yeah. I could certainly understand him having learned to go away inside. And then his mother comes out and says, Joffrey would never have shamed me so. And I was like, really? Yeah. Nothing he did ever brought you more shame yeah, than yeah. this? This is the this is the pinnacle. <laughs> Nothing Joffrey has ever done has been this shameful. Are you sure about that? Shall we take a moment and think? 
One area where Cersei seems to fall down for me, it, compared to Jamie, is the sort of outside the box thinking. She's constantly maneuvering. I said this before to to sort of surround herself with the people that she wants, but she doesn't seem to have any ideas for what she'll do with this dream team once it's assembled. Yes, Jamie's the yes. one who comes up right at the end of this chapter with this solid plan to move their interests forward and to rid themselves of Mace Tyrell's annoying presence. Give him something to right. do outside King's Landing go besiege Storm's End, that is A, extremely difficult, and B, might get him killed. Right. And yeah, and, and they can then move on with their lives without him there, and it would make her much happier for this to happen. Yeah, and Jamie's the one that arranges the dinner for Cersei and Mace right. to kick this whole thing off. Seemingly something that Cersei hadn't bothered to think of as very prudent... And Jamie adds, yes, there's much and more that you can do for little Tommen. So, you know, he's giving Mace something to do, making him feel important, a bit of flattery. Yeah. You would think Cersei would be pretty good at that kind of thing. Yeah. But maybe, maybe she's trying so hard to rule like what she thinks or how she thinks a man would rule that... She's forgetting about using subtle things like flattery and giving out tasks yeah. to make pe- people feel important because she can't be this bad at manipulating. I just... Well, it, it, the, the problem is is that she, she wants to achieve her own ends, which is to have not some, someone who isn't a Tyrell as Hand of the King. That's all she wants, and she's so fixated on it, she can't think of the alternative routes to this, such as redirecting the Tyrells somewhere else, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, what's ironic is that multiple times in the two Cersei chapters so far in this book, she has thought of Jamie as a fool who never thinks before he acts. Yeah. And, and here, Jamie is like, no, this is the... I, I've set you down the path. Now just follow yeah. it. Follow it to success. And, and so their hope is that Mace's patience runs out this time and he elects to storm the gates of Storm's End and therefore get himself killed. And that's a reference to the fact that he he besieged Storm's End in the in Robert's Rebellion, right? Yes, when Stannis and At, Renly were stuck in there, and his patience never ran out. He just sat there and sat there, eating in front of them, yes, while, while they boiled right. their shoes, and until Davis came with his onions. onions. Yeah. All right, just a little bit of a spoiler section for our uh, top buy me a coffee sustainers. Um, join one of the higher tiers and you'll get access to this well thank you for the spoilers that's excellent um can you have some background right. for us maybe maybe background that isn't spoiler this time <laughs> well well we're going to talk about the chief under jailer runner for long waters who is very proud of his surname claiming that he descends from a princess who was in his words the fairest treasure of the maiden vault now we know from a previous background that the Maiden Vault is the name for King Baylor confining his sisters in, within the Red Keep to prevent them from tempting him with impure thoughts. Now, the Targaryen princess Renifer speaks of is Elena Targaryen, and if she sounds familiar, it's because in a Storm of Swords, it's because in a Storm of Swords chapter, we talked about Brown Ben Plum's Targaryen heritage and that he also descended from Elena or so he believes anyway. Well, I should say. Or so it's believed anyway. But the great knight that Renifer claims as an ancestor was Elena's firstborn son, John Waters. The great Admiral Lord Oakenfist, who fathered the bastard boy, was Alan Valerian. Renifer mentions that Alan was married to another. That would be Bela Targaryen, and if you watch House of the Dragon, she's the oldest daughter of Prince Daemon and his second wife, Lena Valerian. Okay. Anyway, John Waters and his twin sister, Jane Waters, were Elena's first children. She had actually hoped to marry Alan Valerian, but unfortunately, he was lost at sea. And as Renifer tells us, John's son changed his name to Longwaters so as to show that he's descended from an anointed knight rather than carrying around the bastard name of Waters. Interesting. Very good. All right, so comparison with the television show, I just have an apology here, really, which is I missed something from last week. But since these two chapters are basically on each other's toes, I don't feel too bad about it. Cersei 
Cersei and Kevin did have a, a contretemps, which is basically caused by, at a small council meeting, she offers Kevin the now made-up uh, 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 title of Master of War, and he refuses, calling, que calling Cersei the Queen Mother and saying he'll be waiting for King Tommen in Casterly Rock, and he departs. This was done oh, at a small okay. council meeting, at which... Cersei, showing a little deafness, gave Mace Tyrell extra responsibilities, adding Master of Coin to his already being Master of Ship. Um, he was appeased and all very happy about this. So there you are, you see, right. a little bit of thought, you can get this done. Um, yeah. She At the same meeting, she said she was going to keep the Hand of the King open until Tommen was ready to appoint his own hand. Okay, okay. But Good stuff. Really, this chapter was entirely dropped. There's no real investigation into... Uh, the Tyrion thing. All right. Uh, pedantry, we kind of covered it, which is basically um, uh, Jamie seems a little bit confused about what he does and doesn't know. He, as you said, yeah. he heard Cersei give the order to, in all but name, kill the turnkeys and then got mad at the uh, Kettle Blacks for killing them. So And seemed to have forgotten. Yeah. He because he he said, I want to speak to the turnkeys. And the under jailer right. said, oh, they're dead. Right. The, the other thing is... Surprised and be, shocked. Because this whole chapter is told in sort of flashback from Jamie's perspective as he stands over Tywin's, it was quite confusing what the heck was going on because Renever Longboard reminds him of the thing he should have already known, which is the turnkeys were dead. And then the next scene, he's standing in the room with the dead bodies and the kettle blacks as if he's just stumbled yes. across it. It's like... Renifer, yeah. did you not think to clean this up? I mean... <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what he tasked... Uh, Jamie tasked the Kettleblacks with doing, I think. Right, yeah. All right. Uh, news and notes. What do you got for us? Well, if you just can't wait for House of the Dragon Season 2 to premiere on June 16th, you're in luck. A House of the Dragon coloring book will debut <laughs> on May 7th. And if you're too impatient to wait for that... Well, George Martin has provided two pages for free on his blog, which is georgemartin.com slash not a blog. The coloring book will include more than 75 illustrations and cost around 19 US dollars. And you can pre-order now at most of the places that you buy books. So get your colored pencils out. All right. Get coloring. Sounds like fun. Uh, casting has been finalized for the Duncan Egg uh characters in HBO's upcoming Night of the Seven Kingdoms live action show. Peter Claffey has been hired to play the lovable Lunk Dunk the Tall. Claffey is a rugby player turned actor. And yeah, he is pretty tall. He's six foot four or about one meter ninety six. As for Egg, he'll be played by nine year old Dexter Sol Ansel, who might be the cutest child I've ever laid eyes on. Um, <laughs> he might be young, but he's been around the acting game for a while, most recently in the Hunger Games prequel, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Can't wait. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. I hope they start filming soon. Yeah. And we've got a treat for you all next week. Our dear friend Jenny of Oldstones has agreed to fire up her microphone and fill in for me as Simon's co-host next week. I just want to thank her because it's really going to help me out. Um, I, I've got family coming in and my older my sister's flying all the way in from LA all Molly's uh musical is next week she's playing Regina George in Mean Girls I sent you a clip by the way I don't know if I you, uh, I saw that you watched. sent me a clip but I haven't seen it yet but I'm looking yes. forward to watching the clip it's just I, from a rehearsal I don't think recording. I'm going to be able to get to the play ah it's understandable yes I, I want to I knew it sounds it really good tough. I mean your daughter is a mean girl that's not typecasting at all <laughs> I know, right? There was a an article in, about her in the student newspaper this past week and it referred to her as the nicest mean girl. Oh, so. that's nice. <laughs> so anyway, thank you, Jenny. Yes, thank I you, Jenny. Appreciate I appreciate mean, allowing me to focus. I'm really looking forward to it because it's fun. To, it's fun to do this with Jenny instead of you. I mean, I'm sure. Yeah. Yes, I I can understand. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and we got a review from Alvacelias uh, on Apple Podcasts in Brazil. Uh, hey. Um. It's entitled The Goat, which I assume is a good thing. Uh, this is Maybe one of it's the, the uh, Black Goat of Cohor. 
Possibly. This is one of the best podcasts I've ever heard. It's so much fun to spend time hearing you guys talk about one of my favorite things in the world. May the old gods bless you and relor light your way. I'm hearing from Brazil, by the way. Thank you. Vala Mogulis. Well, Vala do Harris, Alves Elias. Thank you very much for that. We really appreciate it. When the roadshow comes to Brazil, we'll let you know. Yes, right. Thank you so much. Great review. We greatly appreciate it. Please keep up reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, everyone. It's uh, it's really helpful for yeah, us. Yeah, it's making a difference. All right, let's conclude this one. So, uh, Jamie is not going to be Hand of the King. I think that's a safe assumption at this point. You think? One more time. Yeah. Maybe she could just ask him <laughs> just once more. <laughs> this this book has so few chapters, and so many of them have been dedicated to her asking him that question over and over again. Uh, the tenth time will be the charm. Yeah. I can feel it. And he definitely regrets freeing Tyrion, not necessarily because Tyrion is free, but because he really did not intend for Tywin to die, and he has significant guilt over his part in this. Yeah, and he's he's been unable to grieve for the man that taught him that feelings were a weakness. Well, you reap what you sow, Tywin. Yes, you do. And yes, you he sure do. has a plan for getting rid of Mace Tyrell, which is a solid plan, I think. Yeah. As long as Cersei executes it. Right. If she can uh, just as, stay as nice out for, for one him. supper. <laughs> yes, it's all laid out for her. Just mm-hmm. execute the plan, please. And next week we have Brienne. So uh, no doubt closing in on her quarry. And uh, she... <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> she's certainly on her way up the uh, way castles to <laughs> yeah. the Eerie right now. <laughs> uh, and Jenny and I will have a lot of laughs and fun discussing that. Anyway. So there's four ways that you can help us. You could leave us a positive review like Alva Selyas did. And there's no better way to spread the word, so please do that. You can buy merchandise at ghostofharrenhall.threadless.com. You could buy us a cup of Arbor Gold at buymeacoffee.com slash ghostharrenhall. If you join us at any of the various sustained levels, there's a tier to match your budget and interest. And if you've got the money, you can get into that spoiler tier and listen to all the things that you're not hearing. Uh, you could just make a donation directly to our cause at our website, ghostofharrenhall.buzzsprout.com. And if you're looking for more ways to interact with us, keeping up on the latest Ghost of Heron Hall news and developments, check us out on our social medias. You can follow us on Twitter, at Ghost Heron Hall. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.